Hello and welcome to module two of our all-in-one English Lit Foundation course. In this module we are going to be looking at poetry. So first we're going to look at the literary devices that you absolutely must know and then we're going to move on to understanding the difference between form and structure and finally we're going to look at the steps to analysing any poem. So just to help you guys understand the relationship between these three topics, I've organized it in terms of a pyramid, which you'll see on the right. So the reason as to why we've got literary devices at the bottom is because understanding those key literary devices is fundamental to everything else. So if you're not familiar with literary devices, then there's actually no way that you'll be able to analyze any poem well, okay? And Obviously, apart from literary devices, you also need to understand form and structure, which are also components of any poem. It's only after we familiarize ourselves with the literary devices, with form and structure, that we can analyze a poem successfully. So here's, here's just an overview of those three pillars. And so with that, let's jump straight into our first topic. So I want us to think about literary devices in three main categories, okay? So the first category would be language devices, so the ones that are based on words. The second one is sonic devices, so these are the devices that are related to sound in poetry. And finally, there's the syntactic devices, which are devices related to lines or sentences. So here's an overview of all the literary devices that I think you guys should know. So there are obviously a lot of other literary devices, but those are, I think, more advanced. So for those more advanced literary devices, you can look at that in my future courses. But for now, I think just the literary devices in front of you are the ones that we absolutely must know, just as a foundation. So let's start by looking at comparative devices. So obviously with the first set of comparative devices, we've got simile and metaphor. And so simile is really just the direct comparison of two similar things, whereas metaphor is a little bit more hidden. It's the implied comparison of two similar things. And so how can we tell if a reference contains a simile or a metaphor? A simile is indicated by the structure a is like B or A is as something as B. So an example would be her eyes are like the sun or her eyes are as bright as the sun. Whereas a metaphor is indicated by a structure which equates two references that share a common quality. But of course, we understand that these references aren't literally the same thing, such as this example right here, when I say her eyes are the sun. Clearly, we know that her eyes or anyone's eyes wouldn't be the same thing as the sun, but simply here I'm just comparing the two because I'm trying to make a point about how bright her eyes are. So if we know that simile is the direct comparison of two things and metaphor is implied comparison, then what is analogy? Well, an analogy is the extended comparison of two similar things. So what do we mean by an extended comparison? So an extended comparison is really where many parts of one object or situation are compared to the corresponding parts of another object or situation. So there would be many facets to an analogy, okay? Such as this example right here. The shape of her eyes are round as the orbs of the sun. Her irises are bright as the plasma of the sun and her glance as piercing as the rays of the sun. So you see that the different facets of her eyes, the shape, the irises, and the glance are compared to the different facets of the sun, such as the orbs, the plasma, and the rays. This is what we mean by an analogy. It's extended. Whereas simile and metaphor are just a comparison between one thing and another thing. So next up, we've got contrasting devices. I want us to look at this diagram for a quick moment. So understand that contrast is an umbrella term. Underneath contrast, you actually have three main buckets, and that's juxtaposition, paradox, and irony. 
So juxtaposition is different from paradox and irony in that juxtaposition is related to oppositional ideas, whereas paradox and irony deal with contradictory ideas. And underneath juxtaposition, you've got antithesis, whereas underneath paradox, you've got oxymoron. And underneath irony, you've got three main types, and they're situational, verbal, and dramatic irony. And you see that I've arranged all of these devices according to their degree of specificity. The lower down the diagram, the more specific of a literary device it is in terms of its linguistic arrangement. So let's take a look at the next slide to see just exactly what we mean by that. So juxtaposition is really when two opposite ideas are placed closely together, whereas antithesis is more specific. It's two opposite ideas contained in a syntactically balanced statement. So what do we mean by that? Let's take a look. As long as two opposite ideas appear in close proximity, whether it's in a sentence, paragraph or passage, then you can call that juxtaposition. But for antithesis, the two opposite ideas must be arranged in a grammatically parallel manner. So let's take a look at these two examples to see what we mean. So for juxtaposition, we've got the sentence, in the poorer parts of the city, the pall of factory smoke hangs perennially in the atmosphere. Yet in the wealthier neighborhoods, there's no shortage of fresh air. So you see there are two opposite ideas here. First, you've got poorer parts of the city, the poor, and you've got the wealthier neighborhoods. So that's the poor versus the rich. There's two opposite ideas. And of course, you have the other set of opposite ideas with factory smoke being in the atmosphere and fresh air, right? So again, dirty air versus clean air, another set of opposite ideas. But for the antithesis example, whereas factory smoke permeate the poorer parts of the city, fresh air abounds in the wealthier neighborhoods. You see that factory smoke and fresh air are placed in the former part of each clause, whereas poorer parts and wealthier neighborhoods are placed in the latter half of each clause. So you see that these are arranged in a grammatically parallel manner. So this is important when we consider whether or not something is antithesis or just juxtaposition. If juxtaposition and antithesis both deal with opposite ideas, remember we said that paradox and oxymoron deal with contradictory ideas. Paradox is simply when two contradictory ideas are placed together, but oxymoron more specific when two contradictory ideas are contained in a single phrase. So let's see what exactly we mean. So with paradox, as long as a passage contains two contradictory ideas, and note, the contradiction can be explained after we close read the situation of passage, then it's paradox. If we can't actually explain it, then it would just be an illogicality. Whereas oxymoron has to be arranged in a short adjectival phrase, right? So for example, an honest liar. If it's a paradox, then I'll simply say, I always lie, so don't trust anything I say. Well, that's paradoxical because if you always lie, then this statement alone would also be a lie, which means you're not lying. But for an oxymoron, I'm saying, oh, I'm an honest liar. Honest, an adjective, liar, a noun. But these ideas, when placed together, are contradictory because if you're a liar, then by definition, you must be dishonest, right? Next up, we've got irony. So irony is a literary device that tends to trip up a lot of students. But just remember, all irony is about some form of contradiction. So it's all about the opposite of expectations. So situational irony is when something happens contrary to our expectation. For example, when a math professor fails an elementary school math exam. So that's obviously the opposite of what we would expect of a math professor, right? Because if you're a math professor, you must be very proficient at mathematics. And then verbal irony is perhaps something that we're more familiar with. It's really just sarcasm when someone says the opposite of what he or she means. So for example, the math professor, if he were to say, well, I'm clearly an expert on the subject after receiving that failed elementary school exam paper, well, then that's clearly him being very sarcastic because he's failed the exam, right? So he's actually making fun of himself and that it turns out he's actually not quite the expert. And then finally, we've got dramatic irony, which is more specific to literature. It's when the fictional character doesn't know what the reader or sometimes the audience already does. So a really famous example of this is at the start of Romeo and Juliet, 
when the prologue already reveals to the audience that the two lovers will die by the end of the play. But as we move into Act 1, Romeo and Juliet, they fall in love and they're really excited about their romance with each other, clearly not anticipating that very soon they're going to die for their love. Now let's move on to the associative devices. So first, let's explain why I refer to these devices as associative devices. Personification and anthropomorphism are both devices that associate a reference with human traits. Symbolism and motif deal with references that are associated with a bigger abstract idea. Metonymy and synecdoche references that are associated with a related reference, whether it's external or internal to itself. And I'll go into detail to explain what I mean by external or external in the following slides. And then hyperbole is about a reference that's associated with an exaggerated version of itself. And finally, with allusion, references that are associated with another more famous reference. So that's why, actually, if we look at all of these devices, we might not actually think of them as being related necessarily, but if you look at the core nature of these devices, you notice that they're all associative in some way. Let's start with personification and anthropomorphism. Personification is really when non-human things, including animals, objects, or even ideas, are given human qualities. And these could be behavior, actions, personality, emotions, etc. But for anthropomorphism, slightly different. It's when non-human things take on human form and are literally presented as human beings. In order to tell whether a reference is an example of personification or anthropomorphism, we've got to ask ourselves, is the reference presented in its original non-human form or in an actual human form? If it's in its original non-human form, but it simply takes on human qualities, then it's personification. But if it shows up like an animation in actual human form, then you've got anthropomorphism. So an example here to illustrate. With personification, the description would read something like, the butterflies danced around my head, right? So dancing is only something that humans can do, but here it's being ascribed to the butterflies. But for anthropomorphism, the butterfly would literally have to show up in a human form. So wearing a colorful cape, the butterfly asked, do you like my outfit? So wearing a colorful cape is just not something that the butterfly can do on its own. But here, the butterfly is actually, if you imagine this visually, the butterfly is showing up as if it were a human being wearing this colorful outfit. So next up, symbolism and motif. So symbolism is when something represents an idea. So usually this would be an object, sometimes it might be a gesture, but it always is one thing that represents a bigger idea. Motif, however, is about an idea which recurs throughout a text, okay? So really to tell them apart, it's to do with frequency. So how frequently does the symbolic reference appear in a text? If it's just once or twice, but carries lots of significance, then it's symbolism. But if it appears throughout a text, then it's motif. An example from Macbeth perhaps would do the job of illustrating. So in Macbeth, the dagger, which is the weapon that Macbeth uses to kill King Duncan, it only appears in act two, but it's really important because it symbolizes the central idea of violence in this play. For motif, perhaps it would be hallucinations because they recur in the play. Before Macbeth kills Duncan in Act 2, when he sees Banquo's ghost in Act 3, and the apparitions in Act 4, and also when Lady Macbeth imagines spots on her hands in Act 5. So altogether, all of these hallucination references represent the inescapability of guilt. And the fact that they appear in Acts 2, 3, 4, and 5 are indicative of this reference specifically being a motif rather than a symbol. So metonymy and synecdoche, this is one that a lot of students tend to find confusing and for good reason, because, well, first of all, these are difficult words, right? But also because they're very, very similar. Metonymy is a reference that stands in for a related idea, but synecdoche is a reference which has to be literally part of a bigger thing or idea 
And it's the use of this smaller reference to stand in for that bigger thing or idea. In order to determine if something is metonymy or synecdoche, you've got to ask yourself if the reference is literally connected to the thing or the idea it stands in for. If not, um, it's just as an associated related idea, then it's metonymy. But if it's literally attached to that bigger thing or idea, then it's synecdoche. An example here to illustrate. With an example of metonymy, I'd probably say her head is constantly filled with books because obviously I don't mean literally her head is filled with books, but I'm here using books as a stand-in for the related idea of intelligence. Whereas with a synecdoche, I'd say, well, she's someone with beauty and brains. And so, of course, brain is a body part in an intelligent person, or just any person for that matter, because brains is part of a human body, then it's an example of synecdoche, not metonymy. So next up, we've got hyperbole. And hyperbole is very simple. It simply means an exaggerated description. Hyper is the prefix. So hyper anything is bigger than. And so in order to tell something as an example of hyperbole, I think is the description being linked to something that's a lot bigger or smaller than its actual nature? Or perhaps if there's the use of superlatives, such as best, worst, most, least, none, or, or intensifiers like extremely, totally, forever, never, then you've got yourself an example of hyperbole. Here are two examples. Fire president, probably uh, we can all guess. <laughs> if someone says, I'll be the greatest president in history, then clearly that's hyperbolic because greatest means the best, right, ever. Or if we were to say, well, the president's head is bigger than the size of this planet, then again, that is exaggerated, that is hyperbolic because the planet is clearly very big and no one's head can rival the size of the planet, let alone being bigger, right? So there you go, another example of hyperbole. Okay, and then we move on to illusion. So illusion is a reference to something that's well known by many people or just a given group of people. So these could be references to a famous person, an event, a text, a place or an idea. And so there's actually a couple of types of illusion. So let's take a look at some of them. So the first type would be historical illusion. An example, having done no revision at all, I knew I was going to meet my Waterloo on that biology exam. So here, Waterloo is a historical illusion because Waterloo refers to the Battle of Waterloo in 1815, where Napoleon suffered his humiliating final defeat. Next up, we've got political illusion. The energy at that parent-teacher conference was so tense, I could have been at the negotiation table for the Cuban Missile Crisis. So the Cuban Missile Crisis is a period of political tension between the US and the USSR back in around the 1960s. And this was an event which could have led to a nuclear explosion that would have wiped out the world, right? So thankfully it did not happen. But there you go, that's an example of a political event that a lot of people would be aware of. Next up, we've got economic illusion. So workers in capitalist societies grind away at their jobs because of a blind faith in the invisible hand. So the invisible hand is an economic concept by Adam Smith, which posits that by pursuing their own economic self-interest, individuals actually contribute to the greater social good. And then we've got cultural illusion. So this is a funny one. I'm gonna let you finish, but I'm pretty sure that my apple pie recipe is one of the best of all time. So I'm not sure if, uh, if you're listening, you know what this refers to, but I'm gonna let you finish is actually a reference to Kanye West's dramatic interruption of Taylor Swift's prize acceptance speech at the 2009 MTV Awards, when he very embarrassingly cut into her speech and said, well, I'm gonna let you finish, but Beyonce had one of the best music videos of all time, of all time. And obviously that was fodder for a lot of media coverage. Coverage. It was also very embarrassing for Taylor Swift, right? But it definitely made a splash in the news. And finally, we've got literary illusion. So within literary illusion, you've actually got three big buckets. You've got mythical illusion, biblical and intertextual illusion. So an example of a mythical illusion would be, it took Herculean effort for me to wake up this morning because Herculean refers to the Greek hero Hercules, who's well known for his physical might, right? So I'm here, I'm saying, oh, it took so much effort for me to wake up this morning. Biblical illusion, the teacher pinned up her version of the Ten Commandments in our classroom. So the Ten Commandments are the cardinal rules God had set out for man in the Bible. So intertextual illusion would be a case when we're referring to very famous literary works. So here, if I say, my sister and her boyfriend are planning to elope a la Romeo and Juliet, 
well, clearly Romeo and Juliet, are the star-crossed lovers who elope in Shakespeare's famous play. So there you go. These are all examples of illusion and specifically the different types of illusion. So with illusion, it can be a bit tricky because you actually have to have known some of these references in order to be able to pick up on them. And so this is probably not an issue if it's a text that you're studying for a long period of time, in which case you can obviously do your own research. But if it's a, an unseen passage, then this would require some broad interdisciplinary knowledge. So make sure that apart from literature, you read widely in order to build up your treasure trove of knowledge for you to be able to pick up on these elusive references. So next up, let's take a look at the descriptive devices. With description, you can't escape diction and imagery. So diction really just refers to the choice of words in writing, whereas imagery is specifically about vivid description. The relationship between these two devices is important. Remember, Diction always contributes to imagery, right? So there's no such thing as an imagery or an image even when it comes to literary analysis because imagery is always made up of different words. Vivid description is always made up of different words. It's the words that make the descriptions vivid. The common types of imagery would include sensory imagery, which clearly refer to the five senses. We've got auditory, which is hearing, olfactory, smell, visual, sight, gustatory taste and tactile touch. And next up we've got organic imagery which relates to bodily sensations. So these could be pain, numbness, itch, heat, cold, etc. Or kinesthetic imagery which relate to bodily movement. So you're walking, running, blinking, twitching, shrugging. These are all kinesthetic imagery examples. And then finally you've got thematic imagery which is basically an umbrella term for any group of words that relate to the same idea or theme. So there could be color imagery, natural imagery, rural imagery, urban imagery, or domestic imagery, you name it. Anything you can group together as a theme or a topic, you can ascribe that to a type of imagery. And just one bonus term here, which is a little bit more advanced, synesthesia. So synesthesia is the association of one sensation with another. You're essentially mixing your sensory descriptions uh, and matching them up in a way where literally it wouldn't really make sense. So for example, when you say, I hear sounds of blue, that's a bit odd because in order to ascertain something as blue, we need to be able to see it. But here instead, we are referring to the auditory faculty when we say hear. Or velvety melody. So velvety is perhaps more of a tactile description. Something that's velvet is smooth, it's a texture. But then if we use it to describe melody, again, that's kind of weird because melody is something that we can only hear. So here we are mingling the tactile and auditory faculties. So that's an example of synesthesia. But of course, you know, that makes the description a lot more vivid and memorable. And synesthesia is also something that we tend to see in quite a lot of heavily descriptive passages. Okay, and next up, we move on to the sonic devices. Let's start with the easiest one, onomatopoeia. So onomatopoeia is the imitation of real sound. It could be anything from animal sounds, movement of objects, human reactions, etc. So some examples would be oink, creak, yawn, tut tut. So anything that's a phonetic mimicry of a sound that's been emitted, that's really onomatopoeia for you. Next up, we've got rhyme. So rhyme is actually a huge topic, but on the whole, it means closely placed, similar sounding or sometimes similar looking words. So there's actually two main types of rhyme. First of all, you've got full rhyme and underneath full rhyme, you have end rhymes and internal rhymes. So end rhymes refer to words at the end of a line that sound alike. It's probably the easiest sort of rhyme to detect. And then you've got internal rhyme, which are words within closely placed lines that sound alike. So these have to be embedded in the lines. So an example here is taken from Auden's poem, Funeral Blues. He was my north, my south, my east and west, my working week and my Sunday rest. Clearly, west and rest being words placed at the end of the two lines, they are examples of end rhyme. But east and week, they are within their respective lines. And that's why they would be internal rhymes. 
And the next group of rhyme would be partial rhymes. So these are the more kind of exotic kind of rhymes that uh, may not be as easily detectable at first read. So I rhyme are words which are spelt alike but don't actually sound alike. An example would be tough and through. So notice that they both share the O, U, G, H at the end, but they don't sound anything alike. And then you've got slant rhyme, which are words that share either consonants or vowels, but never both at once, because then that would just make them a full rhyme, right? So a good way of picking up whether or not something is a slant rhyme would be to just think about whether the, the words share any kind of echoes with each other, but clearly they don't sound fully similar. So an example would be curious and nervous. Curious, nervous. When you read it out, there's a slight hint of similarity there, but we know that they're not full rhymes because they don't share the same vowel. Okay, next up, alliteration and assonance. Again, it could be a big topic on its own, especially alliteration. So alliteration is closely placed words that share the same consonant sounds, whereas assonance are closely placed words that share the same vowel sounds. So vowels are A, E, I, O, U, and consonants are any alphabet that's not A, E, I, O, U. And so the common types of alliteration would include sibilant, which is your s sound, Plosives, so the more kind of explosive, abrupt sounds, the b, the k, d, j, etc. Fricatives, the f sound. And then you've got liquid sounds, r or l, that kind of roll off your tongue. And then finally, you've got nasal, the n and the m that you feel against your nose. And then obviously, you've got assonance, which is a, e, i, o, u. And that's clearly separate from alliteration, as we've seen. So an example here, I make a great noise of rustling all day like rabbit and deer running away. So here we see there's a couple of types of alliteration actually. We've got plosive alliteration in great day, deer, the G and the D sound. A liquid alliteration in rustling like rabbit and running, the L and the R. And then finally you've got assonance in make, great day away. So you might be thinking, well, how is assonance different from rhyme then? Well, actually, they're not that different. Assonance is perhaps one example of rhyme. You can understand it like that. But sometimes assonance wouldn't feature full rhymes. So for example, make, great. You see that it's not exactly similar. Uh, you've got the A and the EA, right? And then next up, we've got syntactic devices, those devices that are related to line or sentences. So the first basic syntactic device we all have to know, parallelism. Because parallelism is simply the repetition of sentence structure. So what do we mean by that? It's when the parts of speech, adjective, noun, verb, pronouns, etc., are arranged in the same place in successive clauses or lines, or even just closely placed clauses or lines. So common types of parallelism, there are two. We've got anaphora, which is the repetition of the same words at the start of successive clauses or lines. An example here from Dickens's A Christmas Carol, the chuckle with which he said this and the chuckle with which he paid for the turkey and the chuckle with which he paid for the cat, etc., etc. So you see, all of the clauses start with the phrase, the chuckle with which. So that's an example of anaphora. And then on the opposite, you've got epiphora, which is the repetition of the same words at the end of successive clauses or lines. And here's an example from Othello, tis a monster begot upon itself, born on itself. So itself, itself, both being words at the end of successive clauses. That's an example of epiphora for you. And then next up, enjambment and caesura. So they are, again, opposite devices. So enjambment is a sentence that continues across multiple lines, and we usually call them run-on lines. Caesura is the pause in the middle of a line, usually created by some sort of punctuation mark. An example here to illustrate enjambment, actually going back to our Robert Frost example, I make a great noise of rustling all day like rabbit and deer running away. So this is a great example of enjambment because the entire stanza is just one sentence, but there are four lines, right? So that's why it's a sentence that spills over and across 
the multiple, the four lines. And then Zezura, going back to the example from Othello, begot upon itself, comma, born on itself. The middle pause there created by the comma is an example of Zezura. Okay, finally, for syntactic devices, we've got meter and rhythm, which are terms that we group together and call scansion. Lots of students find meter and rhythm hard to grasp, and mostly that's because they are quite technical compared to the other literary devices. But on a most basic level, just know that meter refers to the number of poetic feet in a line. So what's a poetic foot? A poetic foot is simply a rhythmic unit. And well, what's a rhythmic unit? A rhythmic unit is something that is made up of stressed and unstressed syllables, okay? So let's take a look at the first line in Shakespeare's Sonnet 18 to illustrate this. Shall I compare thee to a summer's day? Notice that when I read it out poetically, and you'll see that I'm reading it out in terms of stresses and unstresses. Shall I compare thee to a summer's day? You'll notice from my reading that there are five rhythmic units, each made up of an unstressed and stressed syllable. And so actually then, with one rhythmic unit, we call that one foot. And so clearly with this line, there are five feet of unstressed, stressed rhythmic units. As I mentioned, this is quite a technical topic in literary devices. So you can refer to this slide in the future when you're trying to figure out what kind of rhythmic unit um, you're looking at in a specific poem. So let's now move on to the second topic, which is understanding form and structure. I'm going to use an analogy to explain. To think of cars, there are many different types of cars, right? You've got hatchbacks, saloons, caravans, or SUVs, or trucks. So car types, we can think of them as poetic forms, whereas the different parts of a car, we would think of them as the poetic structure. So remember, structure creates form, whereas form contains structure. To use another example, with a Range Rover Sport that runs on six cylinders, that's basically looking at the form of the car, which is the Range Rover Sport, and the structure, right, which is the six cylinders that are part of the Range Rover Sport. And in like manner, we can understand a poem with six stances, specifically five tercets and one quatrain, as a villanelle, which is a specific poetic form. Another example, a Ford Mustang is a type of car that requires eight cylinders. And so likewise, with a Petrarchan sonnet, which is again a very popular poetic form, it begins with eight lines, which we call an octave. Again, you see, this analogy tells us that structure always contributes to the overall form. And the form being the bigger infrastructure contains the different structural elements. So to break it down, let's look at Dylan Thomas's poem, Do Not Go Gentle Into That Good Night. Again, there are six stances made up of five tercets and one quatrain, and there's two alternating refrains, Rage, Rage Against the Dying of the Light, and Do Not Go Gentle Into That Good Night, which are, are alternating refrains because they are lines at the end of each stanza, but they alternate throughout the poem, except until we reach the quatrain, which is a repetition of the first refrain. And then there's two sets of alternate chain rhymes, as you'll see, night, light, right, night, bright, light, flight, etc, etc, all the way until the end of the poem. This carries through uh, with and as well as the other set of alternate chain rhyme, which starts with day, and then moves on to they, bay, way, gay, and pray. So all of these structural elements fit the prescription for a villanelle. So you see that actually a villanelle is a very specific kind of poetic form because it prescribes all of these specific structural requirements. But in any case, this is a great example of how the different structural elements would help us ascertain and determine what the form of a poem is, which in this case is the villanelle. So here's a list of useful terms for you to describe form and structure. So remember form and structure actually aren't terms exclusive to verse slash poems. You can actually also describe 
form and structure are also related to prose, as you'll see here. So again, this is something that you can refer to in your own time when you do your revision. And it would be good for you to actually memorize some, if not all, of these terms so that you can analyze form and structure well next time you're given any first or prose passage. And then finally, we move on to how to analyze a poem. Here's the thing, guys. When it comes to analyzing poetry, it's actually a very organic process. Here are five steps to analyzing any poem, but before we jump into them, I want to say there's no better way of analyzing poetry than to just read more poems and to think critically about poetry every time you read any poem. That is really just the way to be able to analyze poetry, to be able to close read a poem meaningfully. So the tactics, obviously I can give them to you, but ultimately none of this will be consistent contact and encounter with poetry, okay? So it's also the reading and the thinking critically that you'll have to do in order for you to analyze a poem successfully, okay? In any case, here are the five steps. So the first step is to look for patterns. So these could be patterns in terms of words, meaning repeated words, or they could be similar structures like parallelism, or they could even be sounds that you hear. When we're thinking about patterns, it's really looking at things like rhyme, repetition, parallelism, etc. After you look for patterns, obviously you need to look at the other side and you've got to spot the tensions. So tension is an umbrella term for anything that sticks out, any sort of conflict, any sort of contrast or irony, right? These are all examples of tension. And then for the next step, you want to scan for meter and rhythm. Now, mind you, this is a slightly more advanced step. So if you're not entirely comfortable with meter and rhythm, then you can choose to skip this step. But I'd say for any top grade literature student, you really don't want to be missing out on meter and rhythm in your analysis of poetry. So make sure that you at least make an effort to identify the basic meter or at least to describe the rhythmic flow of a poem, okay? Even if you can't really really get the technicalities down pat, it's okay to just make an effort to describe the flow and the pacing of a poem. So actually notice that all of these three steps, they relate to identifying and analyzing the use of literary devices in relation to obviously the quotations that you source from the poem. So that is exactly why at the start of this module, I said it's so important for us to establish a strong foundation in our knowledge of literary devices. And then after we do all of these technical steps, we can then move on to summarizing the poem's main idea and themes. Some of you may find it a bit odd why we're not doing this step four at the start. The reason for this is because actually sometimes it's not that easy for us to figure out right off the bat what a poem is really about or even what its themes are. And so in order for us to be able to come to an understanding of what the ideas and themes are, it's easier for us to actually start from the granularities, like the patterns, the repetitions, the tensions, the contrast, because once we look into these details, we're actually engaging closely with the words and what the poem is saying. And so those details help us understand, ah, okay, maybe this is a key idea because a certain word keeps popping up, or maybe this is an idea or a theme because we see these sets of contrast, so we see these, we see these contradictions in the poem. That's why this step would tend to come slightly later after we've dealt with all of the stylistic um, aspects of the poem. And then finally, we'll have to link them together. We'll have to consider how the techniques and quotations convey the poem's main idea and themes. And so remember guys, so, and so remember guys, techniques in literature, meaning those literary devices and what have you, always ultimately serve to illuminate the themes of a poem. We can't just identify and point out those techniques and then think that's done deal. No, we need to actually link it to the bigger messages, the ideas that are conveyed in a poem, right? It's always about the relationship between techniques and themes. How do the techniques in the poem convey the key themes in that poem, okay? Well done, guys, and that's it for this module. I know this is a pretty heavy module, but well done for getting through this if you're still listening. And always remember, you can refer to the deck in your own time as a sort of guide and reference, okay? Whenever you are analyzing any literary or specifically poetry passages.